Good morning, and thanks for joining us. My name is Chris McLeod, and I'm pleased to welcome you here on behalf of Edmonton Global and the Canadian American Business Council. Welcome to the Edmonton region. We are located in Treaty 6 territory and home to a diverse range of Indigenous nations and peoples, the Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakota Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, Ojibwe, Soto, Anishwanabi, Inuit, and many others have lived here and been stewards of these lands for centuries. We recognize this rich history and the role that we as settlers play in reconciliation. We grieve with Indigenous communities as more unmarked graves of residential school victims are discovered. While the scale of this genocide is only coming to light now, this news affirms what Indigenous communities have known for decades. We must all reflect on our unique roles and responsibilities in reconciliation and the actions we take to contribute to restorative justice. Alberta has long relied on its energy sector as a key driver of economic growth. As we all know, the policy decisions made by the U.S. government can greatly impact businesses in Alberta. And we've seen these impacts. While not entirely unexpected, the recent announcement of the cancellation of Keystone XL was the latest in a series of blows to our traditional energy sector. But Alberta is much more than oil and gas. We have the skills and expertise that we need to tackle climate change and lead the way to a clean energy future. We have incredibly skilled talent here, built up over decades. We have more engineers here than anywhere else in Canada. We have geologists, chemists, data scientists, world-class manufacturing of equipment and pipeline infrastructure. We are a community of entrepreneurs and innovators that are hungry for success. And we just happen to be at ground zero of the global energy transformation. The Edmonton region has a successful track record in building disruptive technologies. Our role as one of the three national AI hubs is creating opportunities to apply artificial intelligence and machine learning to the energy sector, accelerating innovation. And we've just launched the Edmonton Region Hydrogen Hub, the first hydrogen hub in Canada. And just last month, Air Products, a global player in hydrogen, announced a $1.3 billion investment to build the world's largest net zero hydrogen network, and that's right here in our region. That announcement has sparked a ton of interest in hydrogen, and between Edmonton Global and Alberta's Industrial Heartland Association, we're working closely with a number of other global companies. So stay tuned, there will be more announcements coming to our region in the next few months. This is an exciting time for Alberta's energy sector. And now I'd like to open the floor to our honored guest this morning, Doug Schweitzer, Alberta's Minister of Jobs, Economy and Innovation, James Rajat, Alberta's Special Representative to the United States, and Scotty Greenwood, CEO of the Canadian American Business Council. Scotty, Doug, James, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Chris. Oh yeah, it's great that you're here. Uh, Scotty, um, uh, thank you again for leading the conversation on how Alberta's energy sector can thrive under a Biden administration. Uh, and if anyone has questions for our panelists, again, please write them into the Q&A. We'll be able to take those at the end. Scotty, over to you. Oh, well, thank you so much, Chris. And it's really great to be with you virtually with two, with several of my favorite Albertans, including the minister and and Mr. Rajat. And and I'm looking forward to our quick discussion and then and then bringing in some key industry leaders as well. Um, you know, Chris, a couple of things happened just yesterday um, that I thought I might uh, tee up, and then and then and then we'll have a, a quick conversation with our distinguished guests here about what it all means. Um, the 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 White House and Congress announced a bipartisan infrastructure framework yesterday. Um, bipartisan is not something that happens a lot in the United States, uh, and but this one is happening and it's real. The deal involves five. $179 billion in new spending, and it finances several major energy and environmental initiatives, from expanding transmission to renewables, to cleaning up pollution, to replacing lead pipes. There's $15 billion in it, Chris, for uh, electric vehicles. Now, some people who are following along may know that President Biden promised $174 billion in EVs, so it's less than his huge ambition during the campaign, but nevertheless, um, it is the largest investment in U.S. history in several categories, clean energy, drinking water infrastructure, electric vehicles and infrastructure 
resilience. So there is a lot there and it all just went down yesterday. One other thing that, I'd, uh, that I'll that i just add, uh, because I think uh, Doug Schweitzer and James Rajat may have thoughts on this as well. Also yesterday, we saw Canada's Minister uh, of Natural Resources, Seamus O'Regan, and the U.S. Secretary of Energy, Jennifer Granholm, they signed yesterday an MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding, and it creates a framework for cooperation on energy. It covers 16 different areas, including cybersecurity, um, to joint renewable energy integration studies. That's a mouthful. Um, and it also importantly, in writing in black and white, acknowledges the, quote, important role that oil and gas and other energy sector stakeholders and workers will play in the energy transition. So. That said, uh, there's a lot there. So maybe first, Minister Schweitzer, we could turn to you and see if you've got some reaction to what's happening in the Canada-U.S. space. Well, you know what? This is a lot of ground to cover in a very short period of time that we have. But you know, from the announcements that we've seen in the last little while in Alberta around clean hydrogen, you've just seen the whole energy industry in our province has really kind of figured out its path forward. And we've I mean, it's been a five plus year in the making type of mindset shift that we've had now in our oil and gas industry. You have many of our players in the oil sands have committed to going to net zero by 2050. Alberta wants to continue to be an energy leader in all forms of energy from clean hydrogen to power generation. We're seeing massive investments in renewable power as well. In addition to that, we're doing an immense amount of research in bitumen beyond combustion, taking our oil sands. The actual value of what's in a barrel of bitumen actually exceeds the barrel of oil. So there's carbon fiber, lots of other rare earth minerals that are there. And with the big push that the United States is making, as, many, as well as many other international players, there's a huge role for us to play from a stable supply chain perspective as it relates to these rare earth minerals. A lot of that's right now is controlled in, by China, about 80% worldwide. There's tension between the United States and China, obviously, uh, internationally. But we have to make sure that there's a role for us to play worldwide in this whole energy transition that is, that's going on. Uh, there's a big leadership role for Alberta to play. Well, absolutely. And speaking of that leadership role and those key messages, James, you've been in the United States now. Uh, uh, toiling in the vineyards, not just in Washington, but around the country and doing it during COVID. So what has that been like? And, and what are you what kind of response are you getting from the policymakers uh, that that you deal with? Well, you're exactly right, Scotty. And, and no, thanks for the questions. It's been an interesting time since May 1st of 2020 as having most of the meetings have happened like this. We've engaged with about 80 members of Congress and their offices since that time and obviously dealing with the administration. And then as you mentioned, the Alberta office actually deals with states right across the country. So this week I was in New Mexico meeting with the Energy Council, which is state legislators from all over the country and then the Energy Secretary from New Mexico. And there's some real interesting partnership opportunities there that I can return to. But Scotty, as you pointed out and as the, as the Minister reinforced, it's a very interesting time in American politics. We're obviously dealing with an administration that is very progressive and aggressive on climate change. And if you couple that with the administration in Ottawa, it does present some challenges to Alberta, especially on the energy and energy infrastructures uh, side, as Chris mentioned at the outset. But it presents some amazing opportunities because Alberta has an awesome story to tell. And it all is also leading in so many areas that can be a model in, in the sense of your second question of sort of a North American energy framework. And I'll give you two examples of that. And carbon capture, utilization of storage, which I think Kate Chisholm and Leland will be talking about later. But in terms of methane emissions, this is something that the Obama administration had introduced regulations, the Trump administration had rescinded them, and now the Senate has in fact put them back in place. They will be changed somewhat. And you have states like New Mexico, which are implementing their own methane emissions. Alberta actually has uh, an agreement with the federal government on methane emissions. Why not take this and make this a North American model, create more certainty for industry right throughout North America? And our economies are so linked that we should certainly do that on carbon capture. There's some real leadership going on in Alberta with the Alberta Carbon Trunk Line and other initiatives, as well as the, the ongoing discussions with the federal government. Let's take that from a North American context, provide some real certainty for industry and really maximize our opportunities as Albertans. And James, when you um, make that case to policymakers, do you feel like you're pushing on an open door? Is there resistance? And then, and then I'll come back to you in a second, Minister. But how's that? How are you being received with those messages, James? 
Great question, because, Scotty, there is a, especially if, if you move to the more progressive side of the Democratic Party, there's a misperception of Alberta. So when I go through the policies implemented, a carbon price on large emitters since 2007, the TIER program, emissions reduction, Alberta, they're excellent um, initiatives. If you look at, you talk about COSIA, which is, as the minister mentioned, is the industry partnership to reduce emissions. You talk about all these initiatives, the hydrogen uh, announcement that was just made, air products investment. All of this is they actually get really excited. And then increasingly they'll say, can I find out more about that hydrogen investment, exactly how you're doing that? How are you leading on carbon emissions? How are you reducing your emissions intensity by 20% over a decade? Like, how are you actually doing that? And we're doing it at the national level and at the state level. So there is a misperception, but once we tell that great Alberta story, it's an open door and people want to just have a longer conversation about it and work with us on it. Um, well, that's good to hear. Uh, Minister, given all of this context, right, Chris teed it up at the beginning with the cancellation of Keystone. We also know we have challenges in Michigan with the Line 5 project, but yet you and James have both outlined some pretty exciting um, possibilities. Given all of that, would you say you're relatively optimistic, relatively pessimistic? Like, how do you feel about the future for the Alberta industry at, right at the moment? Well, it's really interesting. When I started this role last August, originally I was justice minister and I came into the recovery plan strategy in August of last year, a ton of uncertainty in August. We had negative oil prices, a lot of uncertainty as to the pandemic. What was the exit uh, out of the pandemic with the vaccines work? But now that we see you know, the American economy kind of roaring back, we've got lots of growth trajectories that are happening. Alberta's forecasted to lead the country in growth. You're starting to see a lot more optimism. Plus, when you have, add on top of that, this new path forward that the energy industry, particularly in Alberta, has really started to map out. You're starting to see them have the ability to access capital again. They're actually able to get that young workforce. This is the one thing that's really interesting uh, is that young Albertans weren't sure if they had a future in oil and gas or the future in energy. And with the pivot that a lot of these energy companies have done, trying to tackle big challenges like clean hydrogen, carbon capture, making commitments to net zero by 2050, they've really got a young generation of engineers excited again about the prospects of being in energy. And I think that's going to translate as well as we go out and tell the ESG narrative of Alberta. I'd say five years ago, it was kind of it was a very different mindset in Alberta. It's kind of like, let us do our thing and just get out of our way. Whereas now they've kind of learned what the framework is internationally, how to access that capital, access that workforce. And I think you're really going to start to see the beginning of a shift in how Alberta is perceived. It's much, as somebody told me a really funny analogy, he's like, just get a bucket of green paint. We're going to go show the world that we're green and we have all this amazing stuff that's happening here. And a lot of it's around brand awareness as well for Alberta. Interesting. Well, we, we've only got a, a few more minutes left for this part of the um, program before we bring in our distinguished industry guest. So let me let me ask you both, uh, and I'll start with you, James, kind of one more question. And I'd like to ask about context. Um, so so from from our point of view, you know, I'm fully I'm in I'm in the United States. I'm in the Commonwealth of Virginia and uh, fully vaccinated and uh the Canadian American Business Council members, both in Canada and in the United States, would like the opportunity for fully vaccinated people to be able to go back and forth across. And it's it's for families, it's for border communities, but it's also for business. Um, and I worry a little bit that you've got U.S. policymakers, very influential ones, that are banging on the White House door saying, open up that border. And you've got a an, an, an recent announcement um, from Ottawa and Washington that says we're going to keep the land border closed. Now, the air border has been open for Canadians to travel to the United States, not the other way around. So I just want to get a sense from both of you about the broader context of Canada-U.S. relations. Is it given, is, is the border closure, are you feeling it in terms of um, the way the way American policymakers are looking at Canada and and are you, are you noticing it from an industry point of view and, and maybe other broader um, sort of contextual issues about the way Canada and the U.S. deal with each other? So, James, maybe maybe we'll uh, start with you in that in terms of that broader context. Well, thanks, Scotty. And I think it is something we have to be very mindful of when you have the Senate majority leader calling the Canadian ambassador to the U.S. and saying you have to have border rules that apply equally to Americans and Canadians. And frankly, this is an argument we make as Albertans as Canadians, is we should have the same set of rules for products and services and people. I think Alberta has led in this area. Alberta has asked for a border plan from the federal government for a long time. We had the pilot program in Alberta, which I actually used twice in my capacity. Excellent initiative. 
I was hopeful that the federal government would adopt it nationwide. Unfortunately, they chose to move to a quarantine. But I think, Scott, you're absolutely right. We have to move to have at least a plan as to what has to be in place to open the border. Per to what the minister said, I mean, I flew back yesterday. I mean, the American economy is just taking off with the vaccinations, the impact in terms of COVID numbers going down. And we're going to have to get ready and respond to that. And we have to have a place and plan to open the border for business travel, for tourism, for all these sectors that have been hit, especially hit hard during COVID. Yeah, you know. Oh, sorry, just, just echoing James's point. I mean, Alberta is a fly-to destination for a lot of business and also tourism. We don't have huge population clusters that are close by. So we have to get the airline uh, in both ways, the American marketplace, European marketplace, places that have high vaccination levels. I think it makes a lot of sense. We've sent that letter to the feds. We, if they don't want to move fast enough, we'd love to do a pilot project in, in Alberta as well to accelerate that travel. You know, in 2019, um, two thirds of the international tourists to Canada came from the United States and they put $8.7 billion into the Canadian economy. And that's tourism alone. And, and, and I know that um, of the places in the world you wanna travel, um, Alberta has some destinations that are right at the top of that list. Um, and and some some activities. I mean, Stampede is epic. Everybody everybody on this call knows that. Um, and I'd like I'd like to go this year. Uh, I'd love to go to Banff. You know, there are, there are things that that I think are important. And and I th I think there's a, a chance that the U.S. If Canada do decides at, at the end of this next period, which is July 21st, if if Canada says, you know, what, we're going to keep it closed for another month, because we know it's month to month to month, I think there's a chance the US may say, you know what, Canadians, y'all come down, it's okay. So so we'll see what happens with that. Um, and you'd also, you'd also like to come to Edmonton, Scotty, as well, right? <laughs> I would love to come to Edmonton, absolutely. Yeah. Um, especially in the summer, because it's hot down here and it's you know pleasant there. So um, I'd love to take a walk, a walk along the river. Um, with that, Chris, I think we're coming to the end of our of our allocated time for for this section. And um, and uh, Doug and James, please don't go anywhere because we'd love to keep this conversation going and add in some private sector perspective if that's okay with you. So so back to Chris. Okay, thanks so much. And again, absolutely fascinating conversation. And I, I really liked how we switched from talking about you know infrastructure and trade deals and how all of these pieces around energy function. And then we ended really with talking about how do we move people? Because really that's at the core of this relationship is we're really close as, as two countries and two peoples and having those connections where we can fly back and forth and connect and make, again, really meaningful partnerships is, is really at the core. Uh, and I'll just add in that while well, Calgary's had the real fortune of having some direct air connections throughout uh, the pandemic with the US, Edmonton really hasn't yet. So we're really desperate as a community to get reconnected. Uh, and, and just as if you're coming up here, Scott, and we'd love to have you up here, the next week in a bit, it's going to be plus 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So you're not so much going to be able to escape that heat by coming north. Uh, okay, so let's, uh, let's now bring in our industry panelists to be part of this conversation. Uh, we've got Chait Kism, or Chisholm, who's a Senior VP, uh, Chief Legal and Sustainability Officer with Capital Power. Uh, Kate, thanks so much for joining us. And Leland Oberst. CEO and founder of Innovative Fuel Systems. So if we can get both of you to turn your cameras back on and we'll, uh, we'll add you to the conversation. Uh, so again, welcome. And Kate, let's start with you. Uh, Capital Power really is an important player in this transition to net zero. Uh, Minister Schweitzer talked a lot about companies pivoting. Capital Power is absolutely doing that, particularly around carbon capture, storage and utilization. Can you tell us a bit about what Capital Power is up to and, and how you're part of the solution? Well, thanks for that, Chris. Um, I'm I'm so proud of what Capital Power is doing. Like many many Alberta energy companies, we've been working on climate change for uh, well since 2005, um, and and we're working on it in a few different ways. Of course, we are building wind farms and solar farms, but we believe that uh, when the wind isn't blowing and the sun isn't shining, uh, the world is going to need some very low emission or no emission backup power. And so we're also working to take emissions completely out of our natural gas fleet uh, so that it can serve that purpose. On the one hand, we're building a, a big CCUS project that will take three megatons of carbon out of out of uh, the electricity grid in Alberta. And uh, we're also, on, on the other hand, um, building something that is going to take 
carbon that's captured from our stacks and turn it into uh, carbon nanotubes. And these carbon nanotubes can be used uh, in downstream high emitting manufacturing processes like steel, aluminum, tires, um, cement, uh, and reduce the emissions produced in those manufacturing processes because it, it, it allows them to, to do less and avoid emitting an awful lot of carbon. And, and so we're really proud of that. Uh, and that particular process will be able to be used for direct air capture anywhere uh, in the world if we can get a market for those those nanotubes. So um, we we are trying as hard as we can to to use today's processes. The uh, the problem that we have is that uh, for 2030, um, we're going to have to use technology that's available today because uh, it'll take us a couple of years to permit and then a few years to build. And in order to take the emissions out before 2030, we, we, we need to start now. And so we're doing that. But uh, that CCUS process can be used to produce hydrogen. And, and so post-2030, we're going to be uh, firing our, our uh, turbines with hydrogen. And we hope that'll take us to net zero in 2050. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, that's fantastic. And it's... Uh... There's so many things there that I'd, I'd love to kind of pull on. One, one of them, I didn't realize you're doing that with nanotubes. Uh, we're actually hosting an international, the first ever international conference on nanotechnology here in our region almost exactly one year from now. And we've got people coming in from Japan, from Korea, from Germany, other parts of the world, really looking to, to share ideas. Uh, and we haven't had a conversation about that yet, but we, we obviously need to. Um, and, uh, and I think too, people don't realize just the critical role that carbon capture, storage, and utilization has in decarbonizing uh, all of our, our global economy. And really that technology has been, has been proven uh, here. Uh, we're really probably the, the best in the world at it. Uh, and so you, you've got a really, I think, a, a great place to show off what's possible to other companies, whether they're power generation or others, if, if they come here and, and learn from your example. So, so thanks for that. Uh, let's bring in Leland. Uh, so, Again, Leland is with Innovative Fuel Systems, uh, and really their role is, is really about bridging, uh, bridging to net zero in the transportation sector. And Leland, can you join in and just tell us a bit about what you've got with your technology? Sure, thanks, Chris. Um, that's exactly right. I mean, I, you, know, you read all these stories on getting to net zero by 2050, and maybe even by 2030, some would say, but the reality of it is, um, that is a ways away. And bridge technologies, you know, have to sort of rule the world for a little bit here. And what our technology uh, does, and, and what's also very important, is we're actually shovel ready. So this isn't something that's going to be ready in 10 years or five years. But what we do um, in the heavy duty diesel trucking industry, which, by the way, contributes uh, roughly 6.8% of the GHG emissions in the world, um, our technology can go on and burn natural gas at a roughly 50-50 blend with diesel at the same time. So not only do they get uh, emissions reductions, CO2 reductions, but natural gas, as we all know, is plentiful in North America. And um, there's lots of it, and it's quite cheap. So what I've found when we've been talking to our customers, potential customers, is not only are they excited about the ESG play for their shareholders, but they can actually improve their margins. And in that industry, margins and profits are, are, are still very important. I mean, ESG is prominent today and GHG reductions are important, but at the expense of, of actually hurting the profits is a tough call. And what we found is um, some of the other technologies in the transportation industry, particularly with heavy haul, the technology is just way too expensive. And um, so they're very excited about our technology. And again, it does reduce emissions. And the other real exciting thing is we actually are probably six to nine months away from being able to introduce hydrogen into the blend of natural gas and diesel as well. But as wow. we all know, the inf yes, the infrastructure isn't built yet. But um, as you mentioned earlier, Chris, some good news has been coming out. And once that built, we'll be ready to capitalize. Um, yeah. But for now, we're ready, shovel ready, and uh, excited about hitting that industry. It's going to be quite impactful. Yeah, that's hey, fantastic. Hey, you Chris, know, hey, oh, Chris can I just jump in just yeah, with a quick question? Because I just want to take this opportunity. I think it's so interesting to listen to Leland. What I don't quite understand is how hydrogen is going to work in, in the fuel scenario. Can you just, we hear about hydrogen all the time, but how does it, what's going to happen? Like, what is, it, what is you know, what te technologically and just as a practical matter, how do you incorporate that? Well, Scotty, that's a great question because actually it's funny. When I was uh, in high school, I went to the Vancouver World Expo and hydrogen was was pretty big back then. <laughs> and 
and that was in 1986. So this isn't new. Um, there is an infrastructure challenge and there's a cost challenge, right? And I can't speak to that because that's not our core technology. But one thing we did that was quite clever, uh, when we filed our patent back in October of 2020, we filed a multi-fuel, it's multi-fuel technology, not just a natural gas diesel blend. So we were able to introduce other fuels, one of them being hydrogen. And, you know, without sort of leaking the secret sauce, we we already know a pathway to be able to add that with the natural gas, with the diesel. Um, but again, the infrastructure has got to get built, Scotty. And uh, once that is, we're, we're able to mobilize. Yeah, that's a great question. You know, we've been doing a series of conversations with uh, other jurisdictions around the world around trying to really understand what are some of the key problems uh, and challenges. Uh, we've we had conversations with Japan, China, Korea, and, and California. And all of them say that one of the trickiest industries to, uh, to decarbonize is, is heavy haul trucking. Uh, so the fact that you've got, again, got this bridge to it, I think is, is critical. And uh, in terms of the kind of the, the technology or the how do we do that, Scotty, to your point, uh, a lot of it's around uh, liquid hydrogen is, is kind of what the, the current thinking is. And one of the great things about uh, that air products uh, project that's going to be on stream in 2024 is they believe they'll have enough liquid hydrogen produced to service all of the heavy haul busing, kind of that transport, even even trains sector, uh, with what they're producing out of uh, out of that one network, out of that one facility. So it's it's a really significant advance. Uh, and then again, talking to places like California, they're really eager for what we're going to be able to produce here. Uh, and you know, so getting the pipelines and other infrastructure down to really ship it down to uh, to places like California are one of the next really major critical steps on that path to, to helping the world decarbonize. Uh, okay, so let's, uh, we've got a bunch of questions that have come in from the audience. And again, for all the panelists, feel free to jump in because uh, we want to make this a, a much of a conversation as we possibly can. Uh, the first question uh, we're going to put to Minister Schweitzer, uh, but again, feel free to chime in. Um, oh, no. Oh, yeah, it's from, it's from Mary. Uh, what does the Alberta government see as the top growth areas for the Alberta energy sector? under a Biden administration? Again, so, so pretty broad. Where do you see us growing? Well, I think this is the one thing that we've been just talking about overall here to, today is that we're seeing a massive acceleration of investment. Uh, it'd be interesting to see the perspectives of our industry leaders that are on with us as well. But you know, going back to my legal career, I, we haven't seen this speed uh, of announcements, this scale of potential projects and investment going back over a decade. Uh, I think probably when we were looking at you know, building multiple pipelines was the last time we saw this scale of projects and infrastructure being put on the books. Uh, and again, it's really encouraging to see because we're not done, as uh, we've alluded to, there's probably some more projects that are you know, hopefully to be announced here in the coming months. And it's really exciting to see from pipeline infrastructure, carbon capture utilization, our power market, the investment in you know, targets towards net zero by energy industry players. We haven't seen the scale of momentum happening in a long time. So it, if you take a look at the global North American market, international discussions that are happening at G7 and other places, the energy industry and power industry in Alberta is really starting to leap to the forefront of innovation, uh, as well as the ability to access capital and investment. So it, it's quite encouraging to see us at this stage. Uh, I would say a couple of years ago, many of us were anxious about the future of the energy industry in Alberta, but with the leadership of in innovation that's happening right now, you know, we're all kind of taking a look at this going, okay, we get what the next 10 years looks like in Alberta, which is encouraging. Yeah, and I know Leland and I had a conversation about this uh, just yesterday, and, there, and there's a, a, a question in the, uh, in coming in from the audience too about this. Uh, so Leland, can you maybe just riff off of what uh, Doug was saying, and that access to capital investment is, are you getting more success kind of out of U.S. investors, U.S. capital, Canadian? Do you have a sense of kind of who's, who's kind of further ahead and saying, yeah, this is where we need to go in the future? Yeah, actually, I have a good sense of that, actually, Chris. Before I answer that, though, I would like to um, touch on something that Doug said um, about 10 minutes ago around young engineers wanting to work for um, companies going forward as opposed to living in the past. Like, we are living proof of that. So we actually... Out of our uh, seven engineers, five have actually moved from Eastern Canada. And two actually started the day that uh, Justin Trudeau shut the country down last year in COVID. But um, 
really exciting and they actually want to be a part of a company like ours or companies like ours. And it's absolutely true that it's not it's not just actual comp anymore. It's about being part of some sort of special and moving moving Alberta forward. So I'm glad you brought that up, Doug, because it's I I live in see I'm very lucky to have that. And um, Chris's point, yeah, absolutely. I, I I it's probably music to Scotty's ears, but U.S. investment and U.S. investors are so much more excited about what we've got to bring to deliver and what our path forward is than actual Canadian investors at this point. Um, especially in southeastern U.S. So we're actually in discussions right now with five pretty significant groups um, to invest, and uh, they're really excited. Now, they want us to get down to the U.S. quicker, <laughs> obviously. But, um, Calm down. Yeah, exactly. But, uh, no, it's been fantastic and exciting. Okay, that, that's great. And, again, it's one place where we need to do a little bit of catch-up, I think, is, is moving our capital and our investment. Uh, we've got a really good question here for Brad that – I think maybe we'll put to Scotty first and then kind of see who wants to riff on it. Um, how linked is Alberta's image and reputation to the oil sands? And what are our opportunities to expand this brand positioning maybe into things that are more like hydrogen and green? Um, well, that was a perfect a, a perfect throw. I think James was about to jump jump in. Oh. And, and uh, in, in full disclosure, I, I work with... Um, both the province of Alberta and Capital Power, Leland, we got to figure something out because you're the, you know, I need a hat trick here. But, but in terms of how people in the U.S. think about Alberta, um, there is there is a lot of thought about the oil sands. But, um, but, but again, what Capital Power is doing on on uh, using ca capturing carbon and using it in something like nanotubes blows people's minds. Um, and James has been telling that story. Um, for the last year. So James, I know you were going to jump in, but maybe I could just yield to you. Sure. Well, thanks, Scotty. No, I was I was going to, in terms of the perception of the oil sands, it, it's changing. And this is where we're sort of updating people's impression of it. I mean, they certainly know from an energy independence, energy security point of view, Alberta provides over half of the crude oil imports to the United States, a majority exported to the U.S. in terms of natural gas. So areas like the Midwest, obviously the Gulf Coast, very reliant on Alberta from an energy perspective. Um, but again, as I said earlier, when you get to sort of the progressive Democrat side, you do get some concerns, obviously, on the emissions side. But that's why they're very impressed by what we're doing with respect to emissions and a lot of the things that have been talked about on this panel on car carbon capture and other areas. I'll just do, do a couple of things. So uh, Alberta Energy and our, our office had a meeting with the Council of Environmental Quality recently, they reached out to us to talk about, frankly, Kate's sector just yesterday and saying, like, how does how do you do electricity in Alberta? It's sort of a market-based system, but you're actually able to cause some real reductions in emissions. So how do you do that? So give us some background on how that's actually done in Alberta. And then, frankly, yesterday reached out to again on investing in the oil and gas sector in Alberta. And why is that? Because of COVID, because of the Ru Russia-Saudi price war, uh, the Production in the U.S. has fallen, but the production in Alberta has stayed fairly steady. And with what the announcement that the minister referenced with respect to uh, the major oil sands producers committing to net zero by 2050 and addressing the ESG concerns, now Alberta is in a real sweet spot, not only in terms of its innovations, its advancements, but its traditional sector, which is frankly a 60 percent funder of the clean tech sector. So now investors are saying, Alberta's got everything we want to invest in. We're sort of an all of the above energy approach. So it's a great news story. And it's something that frankly puts us in, again, that real sweet spot going forward. Well, and Chris, when when uh, when James talks about uh, his meeting with the Council for Environmental Quality, that's an office in the White House. So just to, just to give people perspective on that, that is the Biden administration reaching out to the Alberta government office in Washington saying, we, we want to understand and talk to you about what what the future could look like. So I think that's pretty exciting. Yeah, so I should have mentioned that. Another example is the state of Pennsylvania, their Department of Commerce, Secretary of Commerce reached out to our government again, Minister Savage, and said, tell us how you do carbon capture in Alberta. Like we want to, they're sitting there taking notes from Alberta in terms of how we've done it. So again, I could talk all day, but I'll, I'll stop. Uh, but building on what James has mentioned, though, and that kind of all of the above and Alberta being in that sweet spot, uh, I mean, just this week you had Amazon, you know, do an offtake agreement for with the largest solar po power project in Canada, one of the largest projects in North America. And you've got these big, big international companies making net zero commitments. And because of how we've structured our power market, well, allowing for those entrepreneurial minds to come in and find ways to innovate, 
it's really creating massive opportunities where we're leading the whole country in renewable power investment. So it's quite encouraging to see Alberta really started to hit its stride on all fronts. Uh, we've been trying for five plus years to kind of figure out where exactly that sweet spot is. And it seems as though industry is really starting to figure it out. Well, I think, Kate, you, you've been nodding and a lot of this kind of comes to your area. Do you want to chime in on that? Well, I, I uh, agree with everything that's been said. I just want to I just want to add that uh, not only is uh, Alberta um, a leader in CCUS as it now stands, there are Alberta companies that are doing uber cool things with captured carbon. I mean, there are there are companies that are making uh, uh, sodium bicarbonate, which is baking soda. There are companies that are making jewelry. Uh, Lush Cosmetics has started to make soap. We're, we're sort of building carbon nanotubes into the skin of the of jetliners to make them lighter. Uh, and so we're doing all of this sort of stuff with, with, with captured carbon from the atmosphere and doing it in a way that makes it inert and, and completely uh, non-contributory to climate change. And so we are solving not only today's problems, but we're solving the 2050 problem as fast as we can and we've been working on it for a long time and so uh, my advice to Alberta consumers at this point would be don't just buy local buy carbon yeah I love that and it's take the idea of taking something that's been a you know a, a cost and a detriment and turning it into value uh, it's it's really brilliant I know even even the work that's being done uh, through the Alberta trunk line to do enhanced oil recovery you know it's it's using that waste product and they're driving more value out of traditional gas through through how they're doing it. It's, again, lots if, of ways to manage. If I Chris, yeah, please. Sorry, I, I was just going to uh, uh, give a little plug to the announcement that the Alberta government made uh, a couple of weeks ago that they're going to create a carbon hub in Alberta, which which will make this even uh, more economically feasible because it'll allow those of us that are capturing carbon to do it at, a, at to share costs of it. And and uh, so thank you, Minister Schweitzer. Yeah, it's wonderful. And I'll, I'll just add a little bit on to uh, what James was talking about with the, the White House being interested in what's happening here. Uh, after the Air Products announcement, uh, I was in conversation with, with some of the leaders at Air Products, uh, and they were being called by John Kerry's team, you know, who are really are leading climate change for the White House, asking about how are they doing hydrogen in Alberta and getting to this net zero because they, they didn't understand kind of how that was possible here. And it is that, that unique geology mixed with the real innovative technology to make that happen. Uh, and in, in chatting with uh, Air Products, they said they scoured the world to try to figure out where's the best place to locate, again, the world's largest net zero hydrogen network. And they said Edmonton really stood out because of that, that geology, the, the, the prior investments in, in infrastructure, uh, access to world markets, all of these things came together to make this the global hub to build hydrogen uh, and to produce it. And so now it's really that trick of how do we bring in energy companies and how do we bring in transportation, how do we get product to market. And, but this it really is the epicenter for, for North America. And, and again, we can build it at a world scale, which is completely unique. Uh, okay, yeah, so we've, oh, go ahead, Scotty. Chris, I was just going to say, I, I love these stories, and I think part of the message here, from, from my point of view, Canadian American Business Council, is we do really well when we figure out how to collaborate and do business together, and so we always want to make sure that we're not uh, competing against each other or putting up barriers against each other as between the U.S. and Canada, because businesses, as you've seen, um, invest in each other's companies, you know, uh, Leland is looking at the southeastern United States. I know Kate's company has facilities in places like North Carolina and Arizona and lots of others. So, so I think investment can flow both ways and, and engineering knowledge and innovation can go both ways. But it's, it's important that we in Canada and the United States sort of lock arms and say, okay, we are in this together um, rather than kind of fighting against each other. Yeah, let's go for it, James. J James. No, that's exactly right. I mean, Scotty, both what you and Chris said in terms, and this is where I'm going to ask for help, if we could get help from your members on this, is send us your stories in terms of what you're doing. So hearing what Kate and Leland have talked about today, make sure we're aware of that. So if we're in discussions with, again, with the White House, that we're relaying that kind of information. As Albertans, I think we're sort of modest. I mean, I was talking to someone from Suncor and he said, yeah, we have a partnership in Georgia with Lanza Jet and we're going to produce lower emission diesel fuel for jets. And I said, that's a great story. Let me promote that story in the U.S. 
Stantec is the designer, as I understand it, of the largest electric vehicle charging station in the United States in Pasadena, California. That's a great story for me to tell a member of Congress from California or anywhere in the country who believes you know, that electric vehicles are the real future. So this is great stories we can tell. The second thing is once tra traffic allows, we need panels like this down and in, in all through the United States, through Washington and elsewhere, to really tell that great Alberta story to really maximize where we're at right now. Yeah, you know, as Canadians, we tend to be a little too modest. Uh, and Albertans probably are, the, are the, the loudest of the Canadians, but we're still not loud enough. Doug, do you want to chime in? Yeah, and just kind of building on that really briefly is that we really have such a strong ESG message right now. And we've really found that sweet spot where the more that we can arm people with that narrative, the proof points, the industry proof points as well, it just allows us to sell this narrative of what Alberta is. We've been doing a tour recently across Canada, talking to market leaders in Toronto and Vancouver, other places. And when you really show them these tangible proof points, they're like it blows their mind as to where Alberta is and how far ahead we are and the landscape that's shifted in the last few years alone. So yeah, the more we have those proof points, those stories, the successes, it really helps us sell that narrative. Yeah, it's, it's the companies that are evidence, it's the data that backs it up, and Leland's an example of the company. So, Leland? Yeah, I'd say a couple of things on that, actually, back to the investment. When we, um, you know, we've been talking to some Canadian investment banks and, and some in the U.S., and the Canadian investment banks, back to the modesty, they told us that our, our projections needed to be more conservative. The American investment banks said they got to be way more aggressive. This is too <laughs> conservative. And because uh, they said... They, they're going to want to throw bigger checks at you. This isn't enough. So anyway, I, I thought that was quite interesting and, and, and quite good as relations between Canada and U.S. Um, yeah. Yeah, we, we hear that a lot. Uh, okay, so uh, we've got actually, and maybe it kind of connects to this. We've got a connect question from Dustin. Um, so we had NAFTA. Now we've got USMCA. Uh, and again, the connections and moving people and capital and projects back and forth, critically important. Are there any concerns about changes to, you know, maybe one more agreement now that we've got uh, a Biden administration, or are we going to be steady state for a bit? And again, predictability, transparency, speed all really matter. So that predictability of, of relationships is really critical. Uh, Scotty, any sense of, uh, do we have stability coming? Um, well, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's funny when you think about what occurred over the last four years. So you had an administrative administration in Washington that the rhetoric was pretty offensive, you know, on purpose, by the way, the president of the United States wanted to kind of gain advantage by being insulting and whatever. And 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 Canada was uh, rightfully so, the rest of the world, too, kind of very concerned about what's the future of the relationship when you've got, you know, a sort of very disorienting to have this kind of um, obnoxious, you know, rhetoric coming out of D.C. And yet, it, so Canada had a full court press, and this was provinces and municipalities and private sector and the federal government, opposition and government, everybody said, okay, this relationship is so important, um, we need to make sure we get it right. And you had an administration that was tearing up our the foundation of how we do business with each other and wanting to renegotiate the, the North American Free Trade Agreement, right? So, at the, but we came through that with a better agreement, actually, um, for Canada, the United States, and Mexico. So notwithstanding all of the kind of heated rhetoric, um, people rolled up their sleeves in all three countries, and we, co we come up with an, a new kind of rules of the road. Uh, when, when President Biden was elected, I think there was a sigh of relief um, that, okay, there's not going to be this heated rhetoric. But one of the things that we've said at the you know, from the beginning is you can't now take it for granted that everything is going to work perfectly, right? You've got to invest and work on the relationship and make sure that the implementation of the new trade agreement works well. You don't have, you know, punitive tariffs and things like that going back and forth. So um, it's a long way of saying, Chris, we do have stability now. We do have the rules of the road when it comes to the trade agreement. And by the way, I don't think the U.S. is going to get any more new trade agreements with anybody else. So this one is the gold standard as far as the U.S. marketplace. Canada has lots of trade deals with lots of countries, which is to Canada's benefit and credit through successive governments. But I do think we know how things are going to go for the next few years. I don't think the rules are going to be changed. Um, and, and I think that's a good thing. Yeah, and so James, I know both you and Doug have hands up, but you were really at ground zero for a lot of these conversations. I'm curious from kind of that inside perspective, 
you know, how things went and, and where you see as the as kind of next steps. Yeah, well, well, Scott, he is the real expert, so I would defer to her on this, but she's absolutely right in terms of its implementation. The one big thing we're watching for is any Buy American provisions, uh, especially as infrastructure packages. Now, when you talk to U.S. policymakers, a lot of them say, well, when we say Buy American, we mean Buy North American, but we're from the Trust and Verify School, which is we want it actually explicitly spelled out in any legislation or any policy package, obviously, that Canada's included within that North American framework. I think as well, what Scotty pointed out is the Trump administration using Section 232 on things like aluminum and steel, using national security as a pretext for imposing uh, trade sanctions on Canada. I think that's going by the wayside. I think Scotty, like the Biden administration has indicated, they won't use that. But there are issues like dairy. The U.S. Trade Representative has raised that issue. But that's working us through the process. I think that's showing, frankly, how USMCA will work. And I agree with Scotty. It's an approved agreement. And then the two other areas we're look, watching for is country of origin labeling with respect to our agriculture products. And then softwood lumber looks like it's percolating along. So it'll become an issue over the next uh, months and years here. Well, and Chris, I know Minister Schweitzer is coming up, but just on the on the the U.S. using national security um, as an excuse to punish Canadian steel and aluminum, that bothered Canadians. It bothered me, and rightfully so. Just to give context, when now today, when the U.S. hears that Canada views fully vaccinated Americans as a threat to Canadian public health and safety, that here kind of um, gets people frustrated. You have U.S. policymakers saying that that's baloney, and they don't use you know, the word baloney. <laughs> so anyway, when we when we act like each other are, th are threat, uh, that's when the bilateral relationship goes a little sideways. Sorry, yeah. sorry, Doug, I know you've been trying to get that's in. That's a great point. Go ahead, Doug. Yeah, and I think the one thing that's going to be interesting to watch is I don't necessarily think it's going to be a trade agreement that's going to have the biggest impact on back and forth, but this energy framework that they're talking about between Canada and the United States, I actually think that could have the biggest impact on the Alberta economy, depending on how that gets structured. I mean, hopefully we can come to a point where if they're going to go down this path of all the you know, net zero by 2050 targets, all these different you know, environmental push, hopefully at some point in time, we can have a North American carbon adjustment for imports coming into North America. I think that would be kind of a bigger strategic advantage for Alberta, plus with all the investments that we're making, if we can kind of have that North American strategy for carbon adjustments, I think it would allow us to have that kind of level playing field for our energy industry. So it's gonna be really interesting to see how that discussion unfolds over time between the two countries as we kind of take a look at, you know, what how we're gonna to get to the very ambitious targets that both countries are pursuing. Yeah, well, I, I absolutely. And for sorry, Chris, for oh, for, for it. clues on, for clues on that, you can look at the work that Manitoba and Quebec, in particular, have done over the last call it ten years on seeing if clean, green, renewable Canadian hydro will be considered clean and green for the purposes of the U.S. energy standards. So, you know, that's been that's been a work in progress for many years, and um, and that has implications for other Canadian innovations, lower carbon emissions and things like that that we've been talking about today. So it's it's really important that we recognize and benefit from each other's innovations and incorporate that into our bilateral agreements. I couldn't agree more. Yeah, totally. And Kate, I'm, I'm curious about your perspective on this. Well, you know, it's interesting because there are more than 40 major transmission lines between Canada and the U.S. in the electric grid. And so the North American electric grid is actually one single grid because electrons don't uh, recognize the international border. And so every benefit we make on the north side of that border is a benefit we make on the south side as well. I mean, carbon, carbon doesn't recognize the border either. And so... Uh, we're hoping that uh, we can lead in Alberta, but we can benefit the U.S. as well. Um, the uh, We have carbon capture projects in the U.S., and I know of U.S. companies that have, have uh, uh, brought innovations to Alberta. And I think that in this conversation, it's really important to focus not just on where the trouble spots may be, but how much international cooperation there's been for so long. Because, for example, from a, a, a grid infrastructure and pipeline infrastructure uh, security basis, uh, we've been doing that as a single continent for a very, very long time, and we've been doing it well. So um, let's 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 make let's hope that that takes over everywhere. Yeah, totally agree. Uh, we've got a question here from Pam. Uh, what are the key questions that American companies and investors are asking about Alberta? So I don't, I don't know if, uh, if Leland or Kate want to start. When you talk to the, the American thing, investors, are they talking about Alberta? 
they are talking about Alberta and, and, and they're talking about um, uh, stable policy. They're talking about how, uh, given uh, the ESG message that Alberta is now putting out and failed to put out for some time, really, we kind of shot ourselves. We stepped on a rake there, but uh, nose is, is no longer broken and we're walking forward and, and they're looking at Alberta, I think, uh, as a really strong place to make a capital investment or a um, uh, personal savings investment and we're talking to investors in the U.S. all the time and they are very interested because our ESG messages in Alberta are so strong. They read our TCFD reports on climate change and they're really impressed with what we're doing here. Yeah, I would I would echo that as well and I think Minister Schweitzer touched on that earlier. Um, where we are in the world stage vis-a-vis -vis the U.S. is it's almost like that's not even a due diligence question from the investors or whether our technology is going to reduce GHG emissions or, you know, we think ESG when we wake up, go to bed at nights, it's just a given. So it's right into sort of um, other stuff. And um, yeah, they, they, I got to tell, like I said earlier, the American investors uh, that are looking at us have been very impressive. And I, I think they're actually deliberately are looking north for ESG plays like our technology, particularly um, to get down there. Because I think we are ahead of the game, quite frankly. And, and when I actually think about you know, even as much as, as short as 12 months ago, I mean, it was just a bunch of complaining, no investment coming in Alberta, no investment coming in Alberta. And I think I, I, I'm hearing a lot less of that. And let's just move forward because there actually is investment. It's just it wasn't getting on the front pages. And now it's starting to. And I like the fact that James says, let's start sharing our stories and let's get it out there. Because there's actually more, there's more inflows, I think, than people understand right now. And there should be more going forward. Totally. And maybe I'll flip this to, to Doug then, because I, I know you're really tracking innovation, you're tracking investment, especially into tech startups. Uh, Alberta has been an absolute terror with raising investor capital. Do you want to maybe just comment broadly about what's happening in Calgary and Edmonton around, around tech and investment? Well, this is a, another area of kind of that Alberta rebound, which I actually think that the second half of 2021, the real story economically is going to be the Alberta rebound. And you take a look at where we were two years ago, 2018, we had 1,200 tech companies in Alberta. You fast forward to 2020, over 3,000 tech companies in our province. Not only do we have more, but they're bigger, they're raising more money, they have more employees. Uh, so it's really, you know, that whole Alberta narrative as being a place where people want to come, invest, see what's happening on the ground. And just talking to investors across Canada and in North America, it's that whole mindset of we're going to fly over Alberta and get to BC or go to Ontario has really started to shift where people recognize now, OK, we got to be back in Alberta. There's something happening on the ground there. And they're really starting to see an economy that's on the rise, which is really encouraging. Uh, given the uncertainty where we were 12 months ago to where we are right now, it, it's quite encouraging encouraging to see. Yeah, absolutely. I know just from our own experience in, in the Edmonton region, uh, already in 2021, uh, our tech sector has raised about $268 million of investor capital. Uh, you know, we've got this Air Products deal that we've just uh, announced. We've got a number of other ones that we're, we're lining up to announce. We could easily hit between that, uh, that tech investment and these foreign direct investments, we could easily hit $2 billion of, of new capital coming into our province, just in our region, uh, in 2021 during a pandemic, which is, is pretty amazing. Leland. Yeah, I would also add to that, that even, you know, given the kudos to the, to the Americans, but even home in Alberta, I would say that 12 months ago, if you didn't have a piece, a huge piece of equipment or pieces of equipment on your balance sheet, you know, investor, angel investors wouldn't even talk to you. And uh, but I tell you, in the last nine to 12 months, IP is becoming important. They understand it's an asset and angel investment has been um, has been a lot easier in Alberta. So I think I think the mind shift is starting already. It's, it's good to see. And Chris, if I could just jump in on this question of foreign direct investment, because I think sometimes um, you know, it's easy to take for granted, um, if, you know, each other in Canada, the United States. And, and uh, you know, in 2019, um, foreign direct investment in Canada was $973 billion. And 46% of that came from the United States. The next largest investment was 12%, and that came from the Netherlands. 
So there is a huge uh, collaborative economic opportunity. And by the way, Canadian direct investment in the United States is also huge. So when you hear about we've got to diversify, we've got to move around the world, you know, I understand that. But the truth is we have something really great going here. Uh, and and uh, Minister Schweitzer touched on it briefly, but a huge area, of, and, and Chris, I think you talked about it um, briefly, but a huge area of potential for Canada and the United States on investment vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world is on critical minerals and rare earths. You know, that engineering capability, that infrastructure, uh, the solid environmental regulatory regimes that you have in Alberta and across Canada, that's that's a way for Canada and the United States together to outpace places like China, which currently own 80% of the processing of these, of these products, which by the way are used in household go goods, they're used in electric vehicles, and they're used in defense goods too. So do we all really want to be reliant on other countries? Um, or is it do we want to use our engineering and our know-how and our investment to do it right here in North America? Yeah, it's amazing. Again, one more example of something that we have in Alberta at world scale. We've got about one minute left, so I know we, we could probably chat about just that topic alone for another half an hour. But maybe what we'll do is just a really quick run through you know, what's the one thing you want listeners and viewers to, to know about how we can thrive under this new uh, relationship between Canada and the U.S.? So just a really quick round the room. And maybe, James, let's start with you. And we'll, I think we'll end with you, Scotty, as kind of that wrap up from the American perspective. James. I think just understand that there's opportunities, obviously, focus on energy, but it, throughout the energy spectrum here, whether it's traditional oil and gas, whether it's over to wind and solar renewables, um, whether it's in hydrogen, whether it's in clean tech, whether it's ensuring the, the security of, frankly, our transmission and pipeline infrastructure through North America, as Kate mentioned, there's opportunities throughout it, whether it's in terms of digital services or the initiatives that, that Leland is working on, there's opportunities all over the place. And the only thing I would uh, emphasize again is make sure you are telling us, telling me those great stories about your great opportunities and ensuring that we can then tell that Alberta story here in the United States. Okay, love it. Opportunity, opportunity, opportunity. Connect with James. Okay, Leland, how about you? Um, you know, I'm going to be succinct here. I would just say we're open for business. We're not living in the past anymore, and we're open for business. Love it. Kate? Uh, every single energy company in Alberta, including the oil sands producers, is all over climate change, and we will get to 2030, and we will get to 2050. Have faith. Fantastic. Doug? Uh, the Alberta rebound is real. Uh, Alberta has its swagger back. We've figured out ESG. We're going to continue to be an energy leader internationally. Uh, and it's now's the time. Let's get going. Love it. And Mary, or uh, Scotty, bring us home. So I think we'll go from the Alberta rebound to the North American rebound. And I would just ask everybody to go to www.northamericanrebound.com or check it out on LinkedIn or Twitter and uh, join in. It's all about how we're in this together. And uh, really appreciate the opportunity, Chris, to collaborate with you and, and, and to spend some time with this amazing panel. Um, I hope we can do this in person because uh, we're, we're all ready. I hope this is our last Zoom meeting ever. Yeah, totally agree. And I think there's a real opportunity to have this kind of a discussion across the U.S. just to really raise the awareness of the amazing opportunities and things happening here in Alberta. So, so thanks so much to, uh, to all of you. And again, I think that we really flew by here in the time, a, a lively discussion. So, so thanks so much to each of you and to all the panelists uh, and uh, people who ask questions from the audience. Uh, so once again, I'd like to thank the Canadian American Business Council for, for your help in hosting this event. So thanks, Scotty. Uh, to our panelists, again, we really enjoyed the diverse uh, perspectives that you shared this morning. Uh, there is a ton of opportunity, as James said, in our energy sector, and I'm sure we're all encouraged by the spirit of collaboration and, and goals to ensure that our province continues to thrive. Uh, thanks to everyone, again, who submitted questions. Uh, watch your email. We're going to be sending out a recording of this uh, later today or on Monday. You can also follow us on social media uh, and stay up to date with Edmonton Global Events. Uh, and again, we hope you've enjoyed this morning's conversation as much as we did. And thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, everybody.